Good evening, I'm Jefferson Singer, the Dean of the College and the Fall Foundation uh, Professor of Psychology. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all tonight to this very special evening. When I read Homegoing, I was deeply moved by the vivid stories of each generation. Connecticut College has a strong connection to Ghana through our partnership with Ashesi University. For me and many of us on campus, the impact of Homegoing took on even more meaning with this connection. We provided copies of all of our, um, to all of our incoming first year students, the copies of the book to read over the summer. Yeah. As they prepared to leave their homes to come to Connecticut, to Connecticut College, homegoing was a compelling narrative that helped our newest students think about the cultural and family legacies they bring as they make a new home in our beautiful campus. Tonight's program will unfold in several parts. You will hear about One Book, One Region initiative. This is the second year in a row that we've partnered with One Book. Then President Catherine Bergeron will introduce tonight's featured program. Following the program, you'll have an opportunity to ask a few questions and we'll close the evening with a book signing in the lobby back there. We could not have pulled together tonight's event without the tireless efforts of our community partners. I'd like to thank Bank Square Books, Connecticut Humanities, the private foundations involved, my many colleagues here at the college, including uh, Kim Sanchez, Tracy Reiser, recently retired, uh, Emily Morash, Jill Blodgett, Deb McDonald, Jeff Norbert, John McKnight. And now I'd like to introduce Betty Ann Ryder, the director of the Groton Public Library and the founder of the One Book, One Region Initiative in southeastern Connecticut. Good evening. Uh, this year, One Book, One Region, our community reading project, is celebrating 15 years of bringing people together to discuss ideas shaped by the shared experience of reading the same book. Over the years, we've read fiction and nonfiction and welcomed well-known authors, unknown authors, and first-time authors. Every year, our partner libraries throughout the region offer programs related to themes explored in the chosen book to help set the stage for our author visit. This time around, we've explored New England's role in the slave trade, enjoyed African drumming and dance, heard songs and readings from the Harlem Renaissance to modern hip hop and rap, and discussed the complexity of ancestral identity. Over the years, our books have encouraged community discussions on justice, human rights and compassion, on bullying, immigration, the Holocaust, censorship, and much more. I've been proud of every one of our choices and the directions they've taken us. Like many of you who have followed our one book choices over the years, I have my favorites. I probably shouldn't admit that. It's a, a bit like a mother saying she favors one of her children. <laughs> Last year's choice, Just Mercy, is such an important book that I wondered if we should quit while we were ahead, go out on a high note. What book could we possibly recommend to you after that one? And then we read Homegoing. The story of the two half-sisters, Athea and Essie, and their descendants on both sides of the Atlantic weaves together details that build a compelling narrative of our country's past and present. A quote attributed to Lonnie Bunch III, founding uh, director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, sums up the importance of respecting our past. There is nothing more powerful than a people, than a nation steeped in its history, and there are few things as noble as honoring our ancestors by remembering. I recently visited this new museum in Washington. The museum is filled with iconic pieces of history, Nat Turner's Bible, an extensive collection of photos and film documenting everyday black life, a segregation era Southern railway car, Michael Jackson's fedora, Emmett Till's casket, and works by well-known artists. But the exhibit I keep thinking about is Ashley's sack, a minor unknown piece of history, but once you hear the story, the horrors of slavery and its after effects can't be forgotten. Rose and her daughter Ashley were slaves on a plantation in South Carolina. When Ashley was nine years old, she was sold by the owners. Acting quickly, Rose placed a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, and a lock of her hair in a flower sack for her daughter to take along. Rose explained to Ashley that the rest of the sack was filled with love. Rose never saw Ashley again. 
The sack and the story have been handed down through generations of Ashley's family. One family's story, but a story that brings history alive. In the same way, the stories of Hafia and Essie's descendants in homegoing encourage us to both remember and confront the difficult parts of our history. It is our hope that participating in this year's One Book programs has indeed encouraged our readers to look back at our history and to look forward with resolve to do better. Once again, we are grateful to our partners, Connecticut College, Bank Square Books, and Southeastern Connecticut's public libraries, and to our supporters, Connecticut Humanities and local foundations. Their financial backing, encouragement, and collaboration keeps us going. As this 15th season draws to a close, I'm feeling optimistic that there's always going to be another worthy book for us to bring to your attention. What should we read next? Please go to our website and share your ideas with us. And it is now my pleasure to thank Connecticut College for fostering this partnership between the college and the community. And Jefferson will be back. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Betty Ann. This is a remarkable community initiative that you have created and fostered over the years, and it's our privilege to partner with you. It truly is. At this time, I would like to present the president of Connecticut College, Catherine Bergeron, who will introduce our program. President Bergeron joined Connecticut College in 2014 and is leading the college through a period of positive momentum and change. Most recently, she supported the development of Connections, our bold new curriculum that prepares students for success in a complex and constantly changing world. It requires all students to make deeper linkages between the work they do in courses and jobs and in their lives, both on campus and in the world. I can't think of a better person to introduce tonight's program than our leader, President Catherine Bergeron. Thank you, Jefferson. Thank you, Betty Ann. And good evening, everyone. This is a fantastic site. Uh, I love the One Book, One Region program because it brings together our faculty, staff, and students together with so many members of our extended community. And I am so pleased to be able to welcome all of you to Connecticut College for this very special conversation. We're here tonight, as you know, to talk about a wonderful book, Homegoing, the debut novel of the young Ghanaian-American writer Yad Jassi. As most of you know, and as Betty Ann pointed out, it tells the story of two half-sisters, one Fante, one Asante, whose lives were shaped by the West African slave trade in both Ghana and America. The story traces the fate of their descendants over six generations, and through that history challenges us to think not only about the connections that bind vastly different cultures, but also about how those connections inform the legacies of race and racism in the world we now inhabit. It's a complicated story. I'll admit I spent a lot of time returning to those first two pages where the family tree was sketched out. <laughs> To see where the genealogy of the story was as we progressed. It's also an important story because in the end it reveals how much we ourselves are implicated in that family tree, in the histories that the story retells. How we deal with this history in our present moment is something that we talk a lot about on this campus. Our Center for the Critical Study of Race and Ethnicity was established more than a decade ago as a space to promote dialogue on precisely these issues of race and power and social difference in order to educate students for a more just world. Nathalie Etoke, the Assistant Director of the Center and an Associate Professor of French and Africana Studies, is a leader in this work, and that is why we're so pleased that she's here with us tonight to help lead the conversation on homegoing. Professor Etoke earned her bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Lille III and her Diplôme d'études approfondies at the University of Sergi-Pontoise, 
before moving to the United States to earn a doctorate from Northwestern. She joined Connecticut College in 2009 and brought with her an unparalleled expertise in Francophone Africa, post-colonial Africa, and the African diaspora. Professor Etoke is the author of L'écriture du corps féminine dans la littérature de l'Afrique francophone au sud de Sahara, which means the writing of the feminine body in Francophone literature of Sub-Saharan Africa, and also of Melancholia Africana, African Melancholy, which won the Franz Fanon Prize in 2012. And this is where Professor Etoke's scholarship dovetails, I think, with the Ajassi's fiction. For I think everyone would agree that there is a deep African melancholy that permeates homegoing. The notion of homegoing itself is melancholic. As the no novel portrays it, going home is not easy. It's not about warmth or comfort or sweet reunions. It's about history and responsibility and commitment and truth. And it's a kind of truth that can only be appreciated, I think, by someone who was born in Ghana and raised in Alabama, as Yajasi was. She earned her BA in English from Stanford University a frighteningly short time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it was there that she first discovered the works of Toni Morrison. As a sophomore in college, think about that, students. <laughs> As a sophomore, when she was trying her own hand as a writer, she traveled to Ghana to research what she thought would be a very straightforward story about mother and daughter. But she visited the Cape Coast Castle in Accra, a still imposing structure that represented the heart of the slave trade in Ghana. And everything changed for her at that point. She began learning more about the women who had lived there, both upstairs and downstairs. And the result of that home going of that profound education was the captivating novel that we all read this summer. Yajasi earned her MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop while completing the novel, and it took no time at all for people to recognize what she had achieved. Homegoing was named a New York Times 2016 notable book, one of Oprah's 10 favorite books of 2016, NPR's debut novel of the year, one of BuzzFeed's best fiction books of 2016, and one of Time's top 10 novels of 2016. The book won the Penn Hemingway Award, the American Book Award, and was a finalist for the Barnes and Noble Discover Award, and the 2017 Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for debut fiction. Jossie was also named one of Granta's best young American novelists. And I think as this conversation proceeds, you'll understand why. So I'm thrilled that she is with us tonight to speak with Professor Nathalie Etoke about her life and work. Please join me in welcoming Ya Jossie to Connecticut College. It's a great honor to be here, and I ask Ya to read an excerpt first before we start our conversation. Um, so I'm going to be reading from Yao's chapter. Uh, it comes towards the end of the book. Yao is a teacher, and in this little segment, he's uh, meeting his students for the first time. It was Yao's 10th year of teaching at the school. Every year was the same. The new crop of schoolboys would begin to flower the school grounds, their hair freshly cut, their school uniforms freshly pressed. They would bring with them their timetables, their books, what little money their parents or villages had been able to collect for them. They would ask each other whom they had for this or that subject, and when one said Mr. Ejekum, another would tell the story that his elder brother or cousin had heard about the history teacher. On the first day of the second term, Yao watched the new students amble in. They were always well-behaved children, these boys, having been handpicked for their brightness or their wealth in order to attend school, learn the white man's book. In the walkways, on the way to his classroom, they would be so boisterous that it was possible to imagine them as they must have been in their villages 
wrestling and singing and dancing before they knew what a book was, before their families knew that a book was a thing a child could want, need even. Then, once they reached the classroom, once the textbooks were placed on their small wooden desks, they would grow quiet, spellbound. They were so quiet on that first day that Yao could hear the baby birds on his window ledge begging to be fed. What does the board say? Yao asked. He taught Form 1 students, 14 and 15-year-olds mostly, who had already learned to read and write in English in their lower-level classes. When Yao had first gotten the post, he had argued with the headmaster that he should be able to teach in the boys' regional tongues, but the headmaster had laughed at him. Yao knew it was a foolish hope. There were too many languages to even try. Yao watched them. He could always tell which boy would raise his hand first by the way he pushed forward in his seat and moved his eyes from left to right to see if anyone else would challenge his desire to speak. This time, a very small boy named Peter raised his hand. It says, history is storytelling, Peter answered. He smiled, the pent-up excitement releasing. History is storytelling, Yao repeated. He walked down the aisle between the rows of seats, making sure to look each boy in the eye. Once he finished walking and stood in the back of the room where the boys would have to crane their necks to, to see him, he asked, who would like to tell the story of how I got my scar? The students began to squirm. Their limbs grew limp. They looked at each other. Peter, he asked, the boy who had only seconds before had been so happy to speak began to plead with his eyes. The first day with the new class was always Yao's favorite. Mr. Ejekum, Peter asked. What story have you heard about my scar? Yao asked, smiling still, hoping now to ease some of the child's growing fear. Peter cleared his throat and looked at the ground. They say you were born of fire, he started, but this is why you were so smart, because you were lit by fire. Anyone else? Timidly, a boy named Edom raised his hand. They say your mother was fighting evil spirits from Asamando. Then William. I heard your father was so sad by the Ashanti loss that he cursed the gods, and the gods took vengeance. Another named Thomas. I heard you did it to yourself so that you would have something to talk about on the first day of class. <laughs> All of the boys laughed, and Yao had to stifle his own amusement. Word of his lesson had gotten around, he knew. The older boys told some of the younger ones what to expect from him. Still, he continued, making his way back to the front of the room to look at his students, the bright boys of the uncertain Gold Coast, learning the white book from a scarred man. Whose story is correct? Yao asked them. They looked around at the boys who had spoken as though trying to establish their allegiance by holding a gaze, casting a vote by sending a glance. Finally, once the murmuring subsided, Peter raised his hand. Mr. Ejekum, we cannot know which story is correct. We cannot know which story is correct because we were not there. Yao nodded. He sat in his chair at the front of the room and looked at all of the young men. This is the problem of history. We cannot know that which we were not there to see and hear and experience for ourselves. We must rely upon the words of others. Those who were there in the olden days, they told stories to their children so that the children would know, so that the children could tell stories to their children, and so on and so on. But now we come upon the problem of conflicting stories. Kojun Yako says, that when the warriors came to his village, their coats were red, but Kwame says that they were blue. Whose story do we believe then? The boys were silent. They stared at him, waiting. We believe the one who has the power. He is the one who gets to write the story. So when you study history, you must always ask yourself, whose story am I missing? Whose voice was suppressed so that this voice could come forth? Once you have figured that out, you must find that story too. From there, you begin to get a clearer, yet still imperfect picture. Thank you.
And of course, there are many other excerpts that I could have picked, but I picked that one mm -hmm. because this is college and what we do is teaching. And I thought it was very interesting to have a history teacher as one of the major characters in the second part because we're still having those conversations about history. Mm. And I wonder why is it that you felt the need to have that particular moment that really help us problematize how we view history as a discipline, but also the ways in which the type of history we teach silences the voices of other people who most of the time happen to be, happen to be oppressed people. So I like the connection between power and knowledge, writing, creating discipline, but also the fact that you actually provide a solution. Hmm. How do we need to look at history? So I just wonder, where did that come from? Um, yeah, well, I kept encountering that problem in my own research. Um, so when I started researching the book, I knew that I wanted to begin roughly around 1750 um, in, in uh, the Fanti um, region of Ghana. And so I started by kind of collecting different research texts a lot of which were very helpful. There was a book called The Door of No Return by William St. Clair that helped me kind of picture what the life in the castle might have looked like. Um, there was a book called The Fanti and the Transatlantic Slave Trade by Rebecca Shumway um, that talked about the different roles that the ethnic groups had. Um, but the problem that I kept encountering is that I couldn't find enough information um, from the perspective of the people that I wanted to be writing about. I couldn't find anything um, uh, for example, about a person who, who had stayed in the dungeons, you know, what their experience might have looked like. And so I recognized that the people who were allowed to write these history texts or these people who had given the opportunity to write these history texts um, were the ones who, who kind of ultimately won, you know, the ones who kind of ultimately were able to tell their own stories. And so the, the project of homegoing became, became a project of trying to kind of fill in these silences um, or to kind of lend voice to groups of people who had not been able to tell their own stories. Um, and so I guess because I was encountering that problem again and again, I wanted a, a character who could kind of discuss it um, in, a, in, a, in a concretized way. Okay, now let's go back to the title of the book, Homegoing. Why the <laughs> title? I have a little theory, but I will let you speak. <laughs> I'm curious about your theory. Uh, when I started the book, it had a different title. Um, originally, I called it African America, and I worked on this novel for probably about seven years. Um, and, and it was African America up until year six. Um, and a couple of things happened. First, uh, I just felt like it had started to kind of outgrow that. The title felt like it was speaking more to one side of the story and not the other. And then the other thing that happened is that Americana came out um, <laughs> while I was writing the book and I felt like I couldn't have America in my title anymore. Um, and so when thinking about new titles, homegoing was kind of the first thing that occurred to me. Um, traditionally, the term homegoing refers to slave funerals. Mm -hmm. The idea is that when your body died, your spirit could return to the place from which you had been ripped. Yeah. Um, and so I, I liked that for um, kind of carrying with it this, this resonance of, you know, it, even if you don't end up in the place where your ancestors once were, you still have a, a part of that somewhere inside of you. Um, and it felt, it felt particularly appropriate for a novel where so many of the characters ultimately are in a place that is not their original home. My theory was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, I mean, when I read your novel, there's so much to say, but what really struck me is the interconnectedness between memory and forgetting, silencing the past, and the need to produce a discourse about the past in order to have a better understanding of one's identity and place in the world. So I would like to ask you, at what extent do memory forgetting and silencing the past shaped the identities of your characters. Mm. It was really important to me, I guess, that I write this book chronologically. And part of that um, is because I felt uh, that we kind of don't really know who, I wouldn't know who a character was until I knew who that character's parents were, who that, parent, uh, that character's grandparents were. And um, this idea that we are kind of formed by, um, formed by 
um, all of these stories that came before us, and not just those stories, but the way that people tell us those stories, right? So the kind of the memory itself. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought of the novel structure, I guess, as a family tree. Um, so you're kind of only getting the little bits and pieces that have been given to you by your grandparents, by your parents. Um, in my own life, this feels true. I mean, I, I, only, I only know my grandmother through memory or through, through the construction of these stories that I've been told. Um, and so for a novel that was attempting, I guess, to cover, first of all, this, this crazy length of time and have these many characters, I felt like the, the idea of memory needed to be this kind of propulsive force. And then we have the question of forgetting also, mm. because, and silencing. Mm. For instance, I need to go back to this family tree here so that I don't embarrass myself <laughs> in public. When we think about the ancestral figure, the fact that as a reader you find out later on that she ran away and she's actually the one who set up that fire, mm. but you have to keep up because even at the beginning, there's a silencing of that event. Mm. Therefore, Ephia thinks that Baba is her mother, right. and she doesn't understand why she's so abusive, but she doesn't know. And it's after her father passed away that her brother actually told her the truth about who she is, and then everything starts to make sense. Mm. So my question is, and I think this was beautifully done. I don't know how you did this. <laughs> but, um, in terms of, yes, memory affect who we are, but how does forgetting also affect who we are and who we become? Mm. I mean, I think forgetting allows us to kind of create something new. You know, for some of these characters, um, it's impossible for them. I don't know if it's, it's necessarily forgetting because it's just kind of impossible for them to, to remember. Um, a character like H who really kind of began a new family tree. Um, he's never going to know who his parents were. He's never going to know where he came from. Um, and so the idea that, that the things we forget allow us to kind of create some new path or a new branch um, on this tree was really important to me. Um, for, that, for that opening, the kind of the first thing that occurred to me for this novel was um, a woman setting a really massive fire and escaping into it. And that fire becomes kind of folklore, mm -hmm. and even through the family lines, we forget about that original fire, but fire recurs so that we have forgotten the story, but we remember that element. Um, so, so the interplay, I guess, of, of what we remember, what we forget, and why, and how that allows us to kind of create um, a, new, a new identity was, was important. And what about silencing? For instance, you have um, Abena Collins, who understand somehow instinctively that there's something a little bit odd about her identity, her father's identity, her mother's identity, because her father ran away from this family business that has to do with slave trade, and he basically decided to become a free man. But in doing that, he had to silence his past. But then it affects his daughter later on, and then his granddaughter yeah. also. Yeah, I mean, I think that character that you're referring to, James, I think that he felt that he couldn't, um, he couldn't find a way out of the family business. You know, he couldn't find a way to kind of continue um, living a life that, that felt, you know, kind of morally, um, morally right unless he abandoned everything. And so when we meet him, or towards the end of his chapter, he's completely broken off from the rest of his family, and doing so creates that silence that you're talking about. And so then Abana inherits that silence. It turns into some kind of trauma. Yeah. That yeah, people, yeah. it's part of the family legacy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I was thinking about James, the British man also, who kind of, we know that he has a wife, he has a family, but that part is also silenced. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Another theory. <laughs> now, um, this must be one of the most controversial component of your book. It has to do with, with the ways in which there is a need to have a conversation about how involved Africans were in the slave trade, mm -hmm. but at the same time, 
have a conversation about accountability and responsibility. So your character, James, also known as Unlucky, says, Ashanti traders would bring in their captives, Fante, Iwe, or Gamil men who hold on, will hold them, then sell them to the British or the Dutch or whoever was paying the most at the time. Everyone was responsible. We all were, we all are, end of quote. And I know it's very difficult to address both victim status and the question of African complicity and responsibility without running the risk of falling into the, I quote, African souls, Africans narrative that is often used as an attempt to silence historic injustice, flee from responsibility, and also prevent any kind of discussions about reparations. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, because of that narrative, a lot of Africans and people of African descent just reject it poorly because there's never enough room to address the complexities and the intricacies of complicity, responsibility, and victimhood within that specific historical context. And you did that. I don't know how you did. <laughs> so could you tell us more about how you handle the ethics of responsibility as a writer of African descent? And what is your response to critiques who might say that if we are all responsible, well, then nobody is responsible? <laughs> well, that's a ridiculous thing to say, right? Hey, uh, but, so, but you know, I, I mean, I, I think I, I have heard, um, you know, slavery apologists use that very line as a way of, of kind of absolving themselves from any, any responsibility. You say, well, Africans sold other Africans, um, therefore slavery isn't our thing. Um, it's universal. Course, Everybody did it. Yes, but that doesn't, that doesn't make it better. <laughs> you know, that doesn't make it right. Um, for me, this, this book started in part because I um, uh, received a fellowship to travel to Ghana and conduct research for the book. Um, and when doing so, I took a tour of the Cape Coast Castle. And the tour guide was so free with this information and was kind of talking about the kind of different roles that each ethnic group had um, in a way that I had never heard before. Um, and, and suddenly I became really I mean, partly kind of just enraged by the fact that I had to go to Ghana and take this tour to get this information in any, in any capacity that was useful to me. Um, I felt like it, it's the kind of information that we should be more comfortable talking about. Um, and if I could do it in this book in a way that was sensitive to the fact that, yes, while other West Africans were exploiting each other, they were simultaneously being exploited. Um, then, then I felt like I was doing the, the history some justice. Which leads to my next question. Um, I like that the, you bring up the fact, this nuance about ethnicity, African identity, and being black, because all of that overlap most of the time, even in the media. I always tell my students that in Africa, nobody's black because everybody's black. Yes. And just, just look at me. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't have a single person in Africa who's black. <laughs> Be like, huh, we know you're kind of crazy, but this really? <laughs> I said, yes, because if you go to Senegal, you have the Wolof, the Soninke, the Fulani. If you go to Ghana, you have Fanti, Ewe. The same way you can think about Native American nationhood, you know, the nations, yeah. the different groups. So I become black when I see you because you see yourself as white and you see me as black. Right. And I think that conversation never happens. That's why we always have this situation, but you were also able to talk about uh, intra-African slavery and servitude within specific contexts while addressing the involvement of Western powers at the same time. Was it difficult to write about those two forms of slavery at the same time? And how did you manage to show the continuities and discontinuities between the two? Well, I felt pretty strongly that in order to kind of understand the role that, um, that West Africans played in the transatlantic slave trade, you had to first understand the, difference, the differences within the ethnic groups. You had to understand that thing that you were just saying. Um, oftentimes we'll hear people say, I can't believe Africans sold each other. But that assumes that there is this idea of an each other, you know, that assumes that there's this idea of a collective 
group, and that doesn't really that didn't really exist. Collective and monolithic. Exactly, exactly. Um, that didn't exist even then, and it, and it still doesn't even exist today. Um, and so, for for this, the purposes of this book, I chose to focus on the Ashanti and the Fanti specifically, in part because my mother is a Fanti and my father is an Ashanti, so I kind of understood those two groups the best. Um, in part because of the roles that those two groups played. Um, but I think it was a way for me to kind of talk about, um, yeah, to just talk about nationhood within, um, within these places that we have kind of lumped together and assumed are one people, are one country. Um, Which actually came out of Western, imper I mean, imperialism. Yeah, exactly. And when, when we say Ghana, we are talking about a nation that was a formed British because invention. of colonialism. We're talking about a group of people who were put together who did not think of themselves as one people. Um, and that's kind of hard, I think, for um, people who don't study um, this, this particular phenomenon to, to think through. In America, we are used to thinking much more racially. So we see black and we think they're all, they're all one, you know. Um, but that was not the case then, and, and it isn't the case now. And also the different type of treatment. For instance, you have the little girl, I forgot her name, who is a slave and who told the other girl that your mother was also a slave. Mm -hmm. But there, there's, there are ways in which she's part of the family. Mm -hmm. She's still a human being. Yeah. She's being abused, but she's still a human being, and she's able to actually have this connection with the other character because they're both teenagers. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain kind of intimacy between the two, which to me, somehow, it's very specific to that type of quote-unquote slavery that was happening on the continent. It's not because you were an enslaved individual yeah. that you were no longer a human being, and there was no, there was, they didn't have epistemic violence committed against you, you could actually become part of the community. Yeah. And I think your book did a great job at showing that at the same time, the difference between the two, it doesn't mean that one is right and the other one is wrong, but this idea of breaking everything down, I think that was brilliant. Yeah. And I don't know how you did it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very difficult to have those conversations most of the time and even to articulate them in such a complex way. Um, then again, another striking aspect of your writing is really the ability to create characters that work in pairs, and sometimes they mirror each other, and they are connected to Mame, the ancestral figure. So for instance, you have the two sisters, of course. You have Ya and Aqua, Marjorie and Marcus. And this is another one of my theories, and please correct me if I'm wrong. All of those characters are scarred. Some bear visible scars on their faces, on their psyche, and within the American context that you describe, black, black skin could be seen as a scar that you're born with, hmm. a scar that bear witness to a lingering sign of mental and physical injury. So can you talk about the multiple scarring that takes place in your novel? Hmm. Um, well, I guess I was playing with the idea of inheritance and, and what we can and cannot inherit. Um, and I think we don't typically, you know, imagine these invisible inheritances. Um, but for the novel, it was really important to me, you know, Yao, that character that I read from, at one point he says, um, he, sa he says he wonders if it's possible to inherit a scar. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's part of what I'm playing with in this book, um, not just in terms of uh, scars that kind of affect families, but scars that affect societies, you know, so if we are capable of kind of inheriting, um, inheriting this trauma over, over generations um, in terms of how, how our cultures operate. And also, for instance, when you think about the pro history professor, you know, some scars are visible. Yeah. And some scars are psychological. Mm -hmm. And I like how you're able to address both at the same time because the physical scar also leads to psycho a psychological scar. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time when people talk about slavery, I always ask them, what are you talking about? You need to talk about enslaved people. Hmm. We're talking about individuals, human beings. You know, slavery is this vast grandiose abstraction. People can say, oh yeah, it was wrong. But after that, when do you start thinking about the type of existential loss? Hmm and pain, and the fact that you have a group of people in this world who will never be able to connect with 
their family, the genealogy was just cut off. Yeah. When are we going to have that conversation? And even if we don't know how to have that conversation, can we at least acknowledge that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think your book did a great job at this. Was, this, was it intentional? Because it's not just about the brutality of slavery, it's what's happening to individuals and what they have to go through. Yes, I mean, I, I was very purposeful about that. I, I felt very strongly that the, that the book should have multiple points of view um, and that I should have like an opportunity, I guess, to, to inhabit as many different individual stories as possible so that we could kind of start to understand the idea that, um, as the epigraph says, each tree has its own position. You know, each person has its, had their own role. Um, and slavery isn't this thing that happened to this nameless, faceless mass. It happened to people, uh, people with bodies like ours, people uh, with thoughts and feelings and hopes and fears and dreams and, and all of those things um, that make us human. And I felt um, I felt like if I, could, if I could do that through this kind of chorus of vo voices, um, then, then it would be an opportunity to show that. Yeah. Now, you said you went to the Elmina Castle, and I have mixed feelings about what they call heritage tourism. I didn't go to Elmina, Isn't I went it? to Cape Coast. Cape Coast, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Cape Coast. What do you make of that um, tension between the fact that some people come to somehow reconnect with a part of themselves which they think they don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you have the state and the local people who are benefiting from that because it's a, some kind of business. Yeah. So what, I don't know what to think about it, but I think there's a tension between the commodification of existential loss mm -hmm. and the need to reconnect with something that is there, but then at the same time, it's gone. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that, because I think, I think it's important to keep these kinds of sites open so that people can experience that connection that you're talking about. I mean, um, I, I, you know, didn't, I knew a little bit about this history, but moving through that castle and being on that tour, and not just for myself, but being able to kind of watch the way that people were having such emotional, visceral reactions to moving through this castle. Like, I understood why it's important um, that these places exist uh, or stay open so that people can, can do that. But I am also equally, I think, conflicted by the fact that, that it's, you know, kind of a for-profit institution now. Um, so, you know, there has to be a way, I guess, to, to balance both of those things. And I don't think we've figured it out yet. Yeah. And I think it's problematic because in many ways, and you did a great job in your novel at portraying that when they see an American, <laughs> they see, you know, you money. see money, the, the ways in which we're still kind of repeating the same story because capitalism is the great winner here. So there's still this disconnect mm -hmm. between diasporic Africans and most of the Africans on the continent, because when they see you, they see you as an American. Yeah. And you have your characters like, no, I'm actually from here, but because of her accent and... So what do we do in terms of... I won't use the word reconnecting, but how do we address that? Because I think that's part of the problem and also part of the solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I also wish I had a better answer to that. I mean, I hope that, that homegoing and... and um, and people who are kind of addressing this question through literature and art and um, et cetera, kind of, you know, offer a, a pathway for, for making those kinds of connections because I don't think that those of us who grew up um, in, in West Africa um, had, had the opportunity to think of it that way. You know, I asked my parents when I was writing this book how much of this history they knew and was kind of shocked um, by how little they knew of it. And my mother grew up not so far from the Cape Coast Castle but had never been there, um, had never really experienced this, um, this particular piece of history. And so there does seem to be this idea that this, these things belong to those people mm -hmm. um, and have nothing to do with us. But of course, that's, that's not true. You know, it's on our land. Um, so it's a part of our story as well. Are students reading Homegoing in Ghana, in high school? 
Um, I think actually at Aheshi, which um, uh, Jefferson mentioned, they are reading it, or they did read it last semester. Um, I don't know if they're reading it more widely than that. I know the book, the UK mass trade copy is available there, but I don't know um, how extensively it's being taught. Have you been invited to speak about the book? I have, Ghana? Not, I have not yet been invited to speak about the book in Ghana. Um, that's not true, not through universities. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ah, we're doing with time. Tracy? Five minutes? Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I asked. <laughs> so, you kind of addressed this already, but in your novel, you portray the diaspora through the narrative of family as they experience existential loss and the intergenerational legacy of trauma while trying to keep love, faith, and joy alive. Can you tell us more about how you were able to portray the Afro-American experience as this constant existential striving which confronts the reality of pain with the possibility of joy, hatred with the ability to love, hopelessness with faith? I mean, one of the most devastating things about slavery, I think, is the fact that it did rip these families apart in really irreparable ways. And so you have a group of people, many of whom cannot trace their lineage back beyond um, a grandparent or a great-grandparent. Um, in, in the case of my novel, um, somebody like Marcus, even if he did all of the genealogical research in the world, he's only going to be able to get to H. Um, because H doesn't know, you know, who, who he is beyond, um, beyond himself. Um, and so homegoing felt like an opportunity, I guess, to restore something. Um, so this idea of restoration came up a lot for me. What can we give back or what can I piece together um, in a way that kind of allows these characters to see a fuller family even though, um, even though it's a fictional one. Um, and, and that was really important to me. And then also, you know, I, I, I think part of what makes this book, um, like injects this book with like little puffs of lightness is the idea of struggle. Um, I think the struggle itself is the, is the, is the hope, you know? Um, the fact that we have a group of characters who are saying, even if things are horrible for me, um, they're not going to be as horrible for my children because I'm not going to let them be as horrible for my children. And that, that tension, that kind of desire to create something, um, something new out of something truly traumatic, I think is, is part of the beautiful resilience of the African diaspora um, and something that I wanted to celebrate. In this I'm so glad that you said that because I sound like a pirate in my classes. Sometimes I always talk about the myth of Sisyphus. Mm and how you know, he's pushing that rock on top of the hill, and mm -hmm. the rock always comes down. I ask my, my students, so is Sisyphus happy or sad or doomed? And they look at me it's like, well, the rock is supposed to stay out there. I say, well, when you think about Albert Camus, the French writer, he said, we need to imagine that Sisyphus is happy, mm -hmm. and his happiness is in that rock, the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. then there's no hope when you stop struggling, but it's not, fun, it's not easy, but the hope is in the struggle. Now I need to give a shout out to my first year seminars people <laughs> here. We met uh, three weeks ago to discuss your book as a group because it was uh, the reading, the summer reading, so they all read it. And at the end of the discussion session, I told them that I will be talking to you today and I asked them to come up with questions. So out of four questions, they selected two. It was a, this was a democratic process. Okay. <laughs> the first one is, which character do you relate to the most? And the second one is, was there a story that you wanted to include in the novel but couldn't? All right, first year students. <laughs> As far as the characters that I relate to the most, I mean, I think both Marcus and Marjorie are the two that I relate to the most, and um, for obvious reasons, they are the closest to us in time, and so I think it was easier for me to kind of um, imagine the questions that they might have been asking and the things that they might have been going through. 
um, and also they kind of share some of my bi biographical information, so that made it, made it easy to relate to them. Um, and then a story that I wish I could have included but didn't, I had initially wanted to set Quay's chapter, the third chapter in England, um, because I had read about the children of these unions between um, the uh, Gold Coast women and the, the British soldiers. Um, and how sometimes those children were sent to England for school and then they came back to the Gold Coast and kind of began to form um, the Ghana's middle and upper classes. And yet I could find so little information about what became of them once they got to England, what their lives looked like, um, what their school days looked like, nothing. Um, and so I initially had wanted, I'd wanted that story to be that kind of third point on this triangle, uh, but I, I couldn't do it in a way that, that satisfied me. Um, so I ended up completely rewriting that chapter. Well, thank you, and it's now time for Q&A. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you for coming to this region. Um, I'm very fortunate to live five minutes up the street, and I stumbled upon your book not after reading amazing reviews. I was looking at my Kindle on the Waterford Public Library website. And what was so profound was actually the chapter that you read from about who is writing the history. Because I'm a 46-year-old woman, and I find it amazing that during my public education, so little was taught to us about slavery. And it was almost glossed over. And if it weren't for events such as Alex Haley's Roots coming on TV in 1977 and, you know, watching a movie with Cicely Tyson, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, these were my exposures to slavery. And I even had a sixth grade teacher, we started to ask her questions and it was something she did not want to discuss. And I think that is so profoundly wrong. So it's really wonderful that the students here are introduced to this book, and you are writing this book and telling the human story, and not just the overview that, yes, slavery is bad, but realizing that babies were ripped from their mothers, women were raped, I mean, people were shackled, they were in, in their own feces. I mean, these disgusting, horrific things that were happening that I find, again, during my own schooling, so profoundly wrong that we were not being taught this in the public sector in the 70s and 80s. And as a student at the University of Rhode Island in the 90s, there was a professor, Dr. Vanessa Quainu, who really was pivotal in, in educating people like myself about these horrors that happened and really opening our eyes. And it wasn't that I was living in a lily-white world, but again, everything was so glossed over so I just really want to commend you for, for writing this story. Thank you. Hello, I have a good question. I just, excuse me if I'm not, like, I just had a question about Sonny's chapter, mm -hmm. about the, um, when you, explained about the drug addiction sort of thing, like what was going through your mind in that chapter, when writing that chapter? Mm, I mean, I, I had always known that I wanted to have, um, have the Great Migration feature into this book somehow, um, and so Sunny's mother, um, Willie, is the character that I used um, to kind of talk about the Great Migration. And so Willie comes from Alabama and moves north, um, and moves to Harlem, and uh, suddenly, you know, she's kind of encountering this new world and this new way of being. Um, in order to write Sunny and Willie's chapters, I ended up doing a lot of research about Harlem um, and kept stumbling upon really interesting um, textbooks about, uh, I guess, heroin in Harlem um, in and around the time that I wanted to write about. Uh, and I think that was really just a case where, where my research influenced the story. Um, I was just so fascinated by what I was learning about um, Harlem at that time period that I wanted to include it somehow in Sunny's chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, 
I'm, I first wanted to say I'm really honored to see you in here. And I have a question about um, the gender inequality and oppression, because I'm from the class which learned gen the feminism in here. And so first it was really marvelous to see all kinds of, like five kinds of oppression, including like marginalization or cultural oppression that we learn in our class. So we could all like give an example in each chapter what type of oppression is this and what kind of difficulty the, all the characters are experiencing. And so I wanted to ask you whether you intended to, whether it was like deliberate to put um, some part related to gender oppression. For example, Effia was told to, was, so when she ha bleed, so she has, has to told her mother that she did, and she was oppressed by not making her own choice about her marriage or her future life. So was all the story like purposeful? And also, I wanted to ask you, what is the most severe oppression in the Africa or in this contemporary time period? Um, it, it was intentional to, to talk about um, women's oppression in, in these earlier chapters. Um, I, I think when I took that tour of the Cape Coast Castle, one of the most interesting things for me was that I learned about how the British soldiers who lived in the, and worked in the castle used to marry the local women, which was something that I had never heard before. Um, and so when I kind of started to, to do a little bit more research into the situation, I was asking myself, you know, what kind of marriage was this exactly? You know, it wasn't the kind of marriage where you had the agency to say, um, I, I pick who I'm going to marry, um, or I even know who I'm going to marry. Um, and so a lot of these women were, were essentially being given away or bartered away for the sums of money that the British had to offer. Um, and so that felt like, you know, a, an opportunity to talk about, um, about agency and, and whether or not these characters, particularly in the earlier chapters, had agency. Um, and then I don't, I don't know how to answer your second question. Um, I don't know if I, if I could pick one thing. I think we're um, all over, not just all over Africa, but all over everywhere. We're kind of dealing with a, a kind of cocktail of different um, oppressions um, constantly. Um, yeah, I suppose um, just trying, I guess, to, to kind of think about the, the continued impact of colonialism um, is something that's important to me. Um, I'm an aspiring, um, actually I'm studying history, I'm aspiring to become a professor and an author. So like, what advice do you have for aspiring authors? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess my, my first advice for aspiring, first piece of advice for aspiring authors is to just read as much as possible um, and, and read really widely and read in such a way that you kind of start to take mental notes of what you like and why you like it and how the author is doing that which you like. Um, I think that's kind of the, the way that you, especially when you're first starting out, the way that you kind of start to understand what your own voice is, what you want to say. Um, and there's, there's no shortcut, really, to the business of writing. You know, you just have to read and write, and that's it. Um, which sounds both easy, but it's actually quite hard, you know. Um, so, so just continue to kind of seek that out um, and, and hold dear the reasons that you want to write, um, because it only gets more difficult. Okay. And also, it took you six years, right? Yeah, Seven, so patience. Seven. Patience is <laughs> also a good one. Remember, the struggle is the hope. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for writing a book that has touched the hearts and really stiffened the resolve of so many readers. I was interested in your story of the title. I was totally ignorant of the African uh, meaning of home going and should have Googled it. But I didn't, and I had my own theory, which apparently is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> to me, 
the title was a very clever optical illusion in that I'd be in one place in the book and I'd think that home going meant going to home, mm -hmm. returning. And then I'd be in another place in the book and home going would mean going from home, leaving. Mm -hmm. And it kept flipping for me. And I so congratulated you on your cleverness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll still take credit for that. <laughs> also, one thing that I intended. And I also, um, you know, I don't want to say goodbye to this story, so I was wondering if you've been approached to either um, have the book made into a movie or a miniseries. <laughs> Um, I have been approached uh, to make the, m the book into a mini-series, um, but w I was also simultaneously warned that this process is really long and uncertain, so I couldn't give you any more information than that. Um, but yes, it's, it's, somebody is working on trying to make that happen. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering how long you knew that you wanted to be an author, and how long after that was until you figured out you wanted to write this book or something along the lines of that story? Mm. Um, I, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a writer. Um, I read so voraciously when I was a child and for me reading and writing kind of always went hand in hand. I, I kind of always thought of um, writing as an extension of my love for reading. Um, I was obsessed with the TV show Reading Rainbow when I was a child. Um, and they had the Reading Rainbow Young Writers and Illustrators competition. And the first story that I ever wrote was for that competition. I was seven, and the story was called Just Me and My Dog. Um, it was a thinly veiled accusation <laughs> thrown at my parents for not getting me a dog. <laughs> um, and I, I didn't win the competition, but LeVar Burton signed my certificate and sent it back, and I kind of felt like, you know, I've arrived. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Um, but from age seven to, I started this book when I was 20, so that's how long it took me, I guess, to, to figure out what I was going to write first for my first novel. Yeah. Cool. One more person s snuck in here, so we'll give one last question. <laughs> Hi. I'm a high school student, actually, and our English class is reading this book, and we're in the middle of it. And I was just wondering what your process was for picking the names for the characters, because actually in class today, we were looking up the meanings of the names and which one were Fonte and which one were Ashante. And we saw that um, Akua actually meant evil. Mm. And her chapter was really interesting. So I was wondering what your process was. I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, I, I, I had no process. I just picked names that <laughs> I just picked names that sounded interesting to me. I mean, the Akan names are easier because um, many Akans have day of the week names, um, and most of the names on the Ghanaian side of the family are day of the week names. Uh, ya is the name for a girl born on Thursday, um, and so you'll see those kind of over and over, and that just made it simpler to figure out which names to use on that side of the family. Um, but for, yeah, there was no real rhyme or reason for most of the names. It's just the first thing I thought of that I liked. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we do have a table set up in, in back, and um, Yah will be willing to uh, sign books after we finish. But if we can all join in in a wonderful thank you and applause.